Uh, we have already seen uh, some part of scheduling uh, when actually we discuss processes and we discuss the code of scheduler in X V six. Uh, we have also seen how X V six implements a round robin scheduler. Uh, but today we will discuss scheduling uh, and the scheduling algorithms as an independent concept, and we'll try to get uh, more in depth understanding of the challenges involved in scheduling, and also we'll see some scheduling algorithms. Now we all obviously know why scheduling is needed. If you have a multi-programming system, then you want the ability to run multiple programs at a time, and obviously then they have to get scheduled one after another. The benefit of scheduling is that uh, the CPU utilization does increase. So, you know, if you did not have multi-programming, then only one program would be running at a time, and obviously the CPU will remain idle. For a long part of time, because other processes will not be scheduled when one process is doing some I/O. Now, what is involved in scheduling? Uh, we often say CPU scheduling because the task of the scheduler is to schedule a process on the CPU. So we call it CPU scheduling. So it basically involves the task of selecting the next process or thread to execute on CPU and doing the context switch. Uh, we have seen how it is done in XV6 code. Then, what is the scheduling algorithm? Uh, basically, the scheduling algorithm represents a criteria for selecting the next process or thread and the implementation in the kernel. Now, why is it so important, you know, to discuss scheduling algorithm and have different choices? So, first of all, it affects the performance because uh, uh, if you have a very bad scheduler. Then the end users will start experiencing delays, and uh, the system will work slowly, and nobody will like the system. So scheduling does impact the performance a lot. That's why it is important. That in turn affects the end user experience. So we will see some criteria used for evaluating scheduling algorithms. And for example, a criteria like the response time. Like for example, you click on a window and the window doesn't close immediately. And that's a bad user experience. Users want a very fast and quick response, and that, to a large extent, depends on how the processes get scheduled. So it does affect the end user experience, and the most importantly, scheduling is important because it involves money. So if there is a system which is shared by a lot of a lot of users together, and uh, they want their applications to have certain performance, they may be paying for it. And today. When we talk of a uh, lot of uh, uh, virtualization uh, experiences, for example, people talk of a platform as a service, and people talk of uh, um, you know different applications on service. So, it, for example, you may have a very large system, for example, a 40-core system, and on that you may be running different virtual machines, and if the virtual machines are being given to you as a service then definitely want performance and that performance will in turn depend on how the scheduling in maybe what is called as the hypervisor or other places works so uh, people often end up paying for the cpu performance that they get on a shared system and scheduling does involve money so it is very important that the scheduling algorithms work properly now the essential concept that we need to know before we discuss uh, Different type of algorithm is that there is what is called a CPU burst and I/O burst in the execution of a process. So basically, we know that a process can wait for an event. For example, disk I/O or reading from keyboard or from network, etc. In this case, we say that the process is voluntarily deciding that it doesn't want to execute; it wants to wait for the I/O. Now, it is during this period that another process can definitely be scheduled. And we say that a process follows a CPU and I/O burst cycle. So this diagram shows you that a process may do some machine instructions like load store, or store, and so on. That is what we call a CPU burst. And during this, it may be doing some instructions which don't involve any I/O. But then, let us say it does a read from the file, and that basically constitutes a I/O burst. So this is the CPU burst, and then you are reading from a file that is an I/O. That's the I/O burst. Then again, some computation will happen. CPU burst again, some I/O again, some computation again, some I/O. So the processes keep alternating between uh, CPU burst and I/O burst. Uh, 
So a process of division consists of a cycle of CPU execution and I/O wait, and there are CPU bursts which are followed by I/O burst. Now, what is of concern for the scheduling algorithms is the CPU burst distribution, because it's a CPU scheduling algorithm, right? It's not an I/O scheduling algorithm. So we are not bothered about the duration for which the process is doing I/O or waiting. We are bothered about the duration for which the process wants to. Execute that is our main bothering. So we focus on the CPU burst, not on the I/O burst. If you just try to understand the same concept with respect to uh, a C program, then uh, say it's a function, f is a function here, and here we are doing some computation. It will not involve any I/O. It will be all in memory in CPU computation. So this represents the CPU burst. While a call to scanf will basically make the process wait. So that will involve one I/O burst. And there is a CPU burst here, and there is an I/O burst in printf. Please note that as a part of executing scanf, because you are going to run a C library function, and then you are going to uh, uh, run some kernel code, and then there will be some kind of a switch function. So all of them will actually execute on CPU, so they will constitute a part of CPU burst. Uh, it is the time the process will spend in the wait queue that will form the I/O burst time. Now there can be some programs which can be CPU intensive, so they don't do any I/O. They keep doing lot of computation for a lot of period of time, and there are definitely applications which are of this sort. So, uh, for example, if you are doing large matrix computations, then they often run for hours. And then the CPU bursts are very very long, and I/O bursts are small, or maybe the I/O bursts only happen in the beginning and in the end, and that is for few seconds. So while in between them you have hours of CPU bursts. So there can be CPU intensive applications, and there can be I/O intensive applications also. So for example, think of an editor, like uh, editor like GEdit or VI. When you are using them. Uh, You might be doing lot of I/O because you are typing. That is input, and that is being shown on the screen. That is output, and if you keep typing for a long time, then you are going to have lot of lot of I/O burst. And then there are applications which are mix of both. So it so happens that actually knowing your workload is a very important prerequisite for determining which scheduling algorithm is good for your system. Now, uh, all of us run a desktop system like uh, Linux, and they uh, often come with only one scheduling algorithm. So it remains a big challenge actually for a uh, desktop operating system programmers to decide on the best scheduling algorithm because the, it's very difficult to predict the load, the the type of processes that will run, and what requirements they are going to have. So, for example. On a desktop system, most typically people will run uh, Firefox and LibreOffice, and maybe a VLC media player intermittently. But then suddenly you have people who are using desktop for programming, and then you have people who are using a desktop or a laptop for running a web server. And all these programs, they may have different type of CPU burst and I/O burst. So predicting there, predicting the type of programs that you are going to run. Uh, is uh, something that remains a real life challenge now uh, statistical observations uh, do show that most of the applications actually have large number of small burst and small number of long burst of cpu use this is true with large number of applications if not with all applications so you can see that there are short duration cpu burst and they are large in number well these are Long duration CPU bursts; they are small in number. So that is a typical observation. So uh, we can focus on applications which actually do CPU I/O, CPU I/O bursts, and CPU bursts are often very short period of time. Now, what does the scheduler do? And we have already seen this. I am just repeating what we have already done. Scheduler will select from a list of processes that is ready to run processes a process for execution. And it will allocate uh, a CPU to the process for execution, and then it will do what we call as context switch. Now we know that the context is a set of registers, uh, 
and switching from context of one process to another process may involve process one's context to schedule's context and then process two's context and we have seen precisely how x86 actually does this now a very important concept all right uh, we have actually covered this but we are repeating it but in a, as a part of a comprehensive treatment now we are going to once again revise when is a scheduler invoked so first of all a scheduler gets invoked when a process which is from running state to waiting state so for example as a part of your right system call uh, there was some iot going to happen and we are actually seeing this code you know when uh, ultimately the code goes to buffer cache and then it goes to the disk device driver and from there the process gets suspended it goes to the wait queue and so on we have seen all this code in x86 so when the process is moved to wait queue it will basically call the shed function that will run second is when the process switches from running to ready state and uh, that is basically when you get a timer interrupt so then the process uh, then the scheduler is invoked as a part of timer interrupt we have seen this code as well the code from trap to yield and yield to shed that is the this code third the process switches from waiting to ready so the io completed now the process is ready to run and uh, after the process is moved to the ready state the scheduler is once again invoked because the job of the interrupt handler is complete the fourth is when a process terminates so when a process is over it will call the exit system call all processes normally terminate by calling the exit system call so on x86 for example you are writing a user land application you will have to call exit on linux what happens so your main just say the return but then the compiler ensures that the main returns into a c library function which will in turn call exit so the exit is there so all processes exit by calling the exit system call so when the process is over then obviously you know after the exit system call is over some other process should run and the scheduler call will be made now if the scheduling happening is under criteria 1 and 4 only then that is what we call the non preemptive scheduling so first is what first is the process giving up cpu and fourth is what the process itself getting over so that is what we say is non preemptive while all other scheduling that is 2 and 3 is what is we as preemptive now if you say the preemptive scheduling is point number 2 that we have a timer interrupt and the process which was running can be moved to ready state because its time quantum is over the third point that is the process which is switching from the waiting state to ready state now see this is happening asynchronously because there was a interrupt and because there was a interrupt the interrupt must have interrupted the execution of an earlier executing process so basically two and three combined together are nothing but interrupts timer interrupt is also an interrupt so if you are allowing interrupts when a process code is executing then it is called preemptive scheduling if you are not allowing interrupts then it is called non preemptive scheduling now the moment you are non preemptive scheduling synchronization concerns come into picture because now you can have access to shared data you can have preemption if you if you are executing in kernel code and you can have interrupts occurring during crucial os activity so all the synchronization problems will now arise if you have preemptive scheduling that is if you are not disabling interrupts all right so this is the problem all right now often a word comes and that word is dispatcher dispatcher is nothing but a part of the scheduler what the dispatcher does is it gives the control of the cpu to the process which is selected all right now there is something called as a short term scheduler and a long term scheduler let's keep it aside for some time Uh, but the short term scheduler is something which you know picks up the process immediately so what you have in x86 is basically a short term scheduler we don't have a long term scheduler in x86 so the three lines of code that runs in the loop to select the round robin process is the short term scheduler what is the dispatcher dispatcher is the part of code which will give the control of the cpu to the next process so this you know is in the context switch uh, obviously switching to user mode after that and jumping to the proper location in the user program to restart that program and there is a term called dispatch latency which is the time taken to stop one process and start another running so picturally 
you can understand it like this that the process p0 was executing and the in between p1 and p0 uh, switching what you are going to do is saving the context and restoring the context and this is what we call as the dispatch latency so if you think of dispatcher in x86 it is actually the core of switch and after switch some tail end parts of shared and trap and trap return and it is yield also i miss the yield here so if you consider that code execution sequence then that code execution sequence is the dispatcher in x86 code uh if you want to see dispatcher in action on linux uh, you can run vm start vm start 13 means show the output uh, you know three times at one second delay so in that output you can look at the cpu colon cs that is the context switches that happened every second so you can see how many context switches actually happened and uh, i think we have see we have already done this earlier if you uh, see the status file in the proc folder for a particular process you will see the voluntary context switches and the non voluntary context switches so voluntary means the process left the cpu so condition number 1 out of the four condition condition number 1 that the process you know said i want to give up the cpu non voluntary means condition number 2 or 3 that is process was actually preempted okay so non voluntary context switches means scheduler invoked in condition 2 and 3 and voluntary means it invoked in the condition number 1 out of the four conditions of invocation of a scheduler let me check if there are any questions in the chat all right no questions you can interrupt me if you have some question now let us come to the scheduling criteria all right and uh, these criteria that we are going to discuss are actually used to evaluate how good a scheduling algorithm is so first is utilization uh, which we say has to be maximized what does it mean how how busy the cpu is right so if you are invested in buying the cpu for 10000 rupees then obviously you want the cpu to be you know utilize as much as possible so we want to maximize the cpu utilization now on linux what happens that on linux a uh, thread is created it is called the idle thread one second so on linux uh, there is a th there is a thread called idle thread or idle task so if there are no processes to be scheduled like there is no process in the ready state maybe there are no processes or there are processes which are in the uh, which are you know mostly doing some io then you know you say that the cpu is idle so remember the cpu will always keep executing something isn't it there is nothing called the cpu not executing some instruction so your uh, operating system will have to ensure that something runs on the cpu even if there is no process to schedule so for example if you look at x86 and you just call the scheduler before even the first process is uh, created what will that code do it will just keep doing running the loop infinite loop trying to check if there is a process which is uh, ready or not so there is still some code which will keep running so what we want to do is we want to utilize uh, maximize the cpu utilization the other criteria is what is called as throughput and uh, throughput is to be maximized what does throughput mean it is a number of processes that complete their execution per time unit now common sense will tell us that the throughput will actually depend and in fact the cpu utilization will also depend on the workload that you have it will simply depend on the processes that you have so suppose you end up running processes that keep doing lot of io all right on your computer then you can't expect the cpu utilization to be 100% obviously because you don't have processes which demand the cpu or uh, for example if you have processes which keep running for a long time you know like many many hours then the throughput is going to be small because you know you in 3 hours you may complete just one or two programs now for example you know you were writing a large sorting program and that large sorting program did not complete in one hour so uh, it will keep consuming cpu and that will decrease the throughput because you will not complete many processes in a given amount of time the other criteria is turn around time and turn around time is the time for a process to complete 
Now, obviously, you want that to be minimized, but then you can't minimize it below a limit because if the program itself is huge and large, it will take a minimum time to execute. What you try to do is you try to avoid the extra time that is, you know, uh, uh, the time that is spent in executing other processes, you know, that can be tried to be minimized. Now, obviously, you would have noticed that uh, these requirements are actually conflicting with each other. If you say I want to try to minimize the turnaround time, that is a time for executing a particular process, then uh, if the process is highly CPU intensive, the best way of doing it is to disable interrupts and let the process run till it is over. Then the process will take the least amount of time for its completion. But then what about the throughput? You know, there may be a lot of small processes which could have completed in that period. You have not scheduled them and that is why your throughput will go down. Because in one hour or two hours, you might have completed only one process. So you can see that these, these requirements, they actually are not, uh, uh, so they are not, uh, um, they are actually conflicting with each other. And the requirement is uh, waiting time. So the waiting time we say is to be minimized because it is the amount of time a process spends in the ready queue. Remember the ready queue word. Often people get confused by the word waiting assuming that it is IO wait, no it is not IO wait, it is actually waiting to get scheduled. So amount of time the process spends in ready queue. Now, obviously this has to be minimized because uh, 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 reducing waiting time will effectively increase the, will better the turnaround time. So we can see the relationship between turnaround time and waiting time very easily. If a process spends no time in the ready queue, that is if the waiting time is zero, then turnaround time is minimized effectively. So there is a direct correlation between waiting time and turnaround time. And then a very important criteria is the response time. Now where is the response time important? When you have a system which does a lot of interaction with the end human users. And we as end human users, we obviously want a good response time. So I always expect that I make a click of a mouse and the application st should start immediately. Or if I close, it should close immediately. Or if I type, Water I type should be available immediately. In fact, in this very session, I'm expecting that, you know, whatever I'm speaking right now and slides that I'm showing to you, they are being shown to you instantaneously. And because of course the network is involved in our interaction, but then the operating system on your computer and my computer is also involved in determining that response time. And we all obviously all the time want a minimal response time. So response time is the amount of time it takes from when a request was submitted until the first response is provisioned. All right. So this is very critical for environments which are time sharing. Now let us come to calculations of these criteria. Now first of all, uh, we have discussed just now that these criteria, there are a variety of criteria and they don't gel well together. You can't achieve all of them at the same time. You try to achieve one and you may have to forsake some other one. But uh, we often want to evaluate an algorithm practically on these criteria. Now, obviously, the results you get will depend on the workload. If you just have one process which keeps doing CPU computation for, say, five hours, then you, that's your workload. You will have very good CPU utilization if you, you know, employ algorithm which does not do preemption. Then you get 100% CPU utilization. But what, what about your throughput? you will complete one process in three hours. So if you ask me what is my throughput per second, then per second throughput will be 0 0.0001 or something. So you can't achieve everything at the same time. So irrespective of which algorithm you have, you always need a proper workload. Okay. Now let me say, when we say a proper workload, there is no workload which will, you know, give you good good performance in on, on some algorithm or on all pa parameters. What we just mean is that depending on where we want to employ our algorithm, we should have a good mix of processes which represent the ideal workflow for that algorithm. So processes with CPU and IO burst, different durations of IO burst, different durations of IO burst, and achieving this is not, you know, I'll say a very simple, simple program because how do you do, a, do, do this programmatically? Like obviously you can't do a end user human input to achieve IO burst, like you do a scan F and then you uh, set your watch and wait for two seconds and then after two seconds you give the input. Uh, 
that is just impossible, isn't it? So even you have to do the I/O programmatically, you have to automate it and you know answer problems like, for example, how to ensure that after two seconds an I/O takes place, right? So and again, you need periods when the system will be idle that you know no process is scheduleable. If you really want to see that your algorithms are working and then again to prove that your algorithms are delivering the performance that they should normally deliver. So to even calculate the different criteria for a given scheduling algorithm, you will have to craft a proper workload. Workload is the set of processes very carefully. Now how can you calculate the CPU utilization? Right. So CPU utilization as we said is the per is you know, utilization of the CPU. So how is it calculated? <laughs> because in a sense the CPU is always doing something. It is always executing some instructions, isn't it? So does it mean 100% utilization? No. Normally we talk about the time spent in doing what is called as useful work. Now what is useful work? <laughs> that is that is the tricky part actually. What is useful work? So if you are on Linux, then uh, as I said there is an idle thread. And it gets scheduled when no other task is runnable. So uh, we say that not running the idle thread is useful or productive work. And that will now include the time involved in running processes, time involved in scheduling, time involved in interrupts. So all that you know you calculate as against the time required for idle thread and that gives you the percentage usage of the CPU. On other systems uh, you have to define, you know, like how are you going to calculate. So on x 6 I suggest that you can say that the time which is spent in the loop uh, selecting the process when there is no process available actually, only when there is no process available is idle work. Alright, or you may even have idle thread in your x 6 you just add idle thread and that idle thread does nothing but some loop and uh, you keep scheduling that thread when you have no other process to schedule. That is how you can do it. All right, so let us discuss how, how to calculate throughput. Now it's very easy to calculate it actually. Throughput is number of processes that complete execution per unit time. So what is the formula? Total number of processes that are completed divided by total time. So what you do is simply divide uh, you know, the time taken for your workload to be complete by the number of processes that is total workload. So that's a very easy calculation. Now obviously it will depend on the workload you know, long processes, short processes, but whatever workload, you know, you can calculate the throughput for that workload. Now, for example, if you have too many short processes, then throughput can appear to be high. You know, like tens of processes can actually complete per second if you have very small code to execute. Then turnaround time. Now, turnaround time is also very, very easy to calculate. It is the amount of time required for one process to complete. So, what you do, for every process, you note the time when it started. So that is easy, you just note it down in fourth. And the ending time, how do you note it down in exit? You note down the ending time. The difference between the two is the turnaround time. So for process P1, you know the time when the process ended minus the time when the process started. Now obviously what this time will be, this time will be the time spent in the ready queue, in running and waiting for IO. It will include the sum of all these, but then calculating it is very easy. You know, you just add some code in fork and some code in exit and you, know, you take the difference of the time and you are done. What we are really interested in is the average turnaround time for the entire workload. That is what we are interested in. So you have one workload and uh, in your projects, those who are doing scheduling al algorithms, you will basically you know, uh, run the different algorithms on the same workload. So obviously you will get different turnaround times because different processes will take different amount of time to complete exec execution because they will be in the ready queue for different amounts of time. Then there is a waiting time and we already discussed what is waiting time. It's the amount of time that is spent in the ready queue. This has to be minimized and obviously it is a part of the turnaround time as we discussed just now. Now remember the scheduling will never affect the waiting time in IO queue. It will only affect the time in the ready queue. So it will only affect the waiting time that is the time in the ready queue, but not the overall waiting time in the IO queue. Scheduling has nothing to do with IO. IO devices work independently of the CPU, right? So waiting time is very easy to calculate actually. How will you calculate waiting time? Whenever you move a process to the ready queue, you note down that time. And whenever the interrupt handler moves it to runnable state, you note down that time. And at that very time, when the process becomes runnable, take a difference and keep storing it in some waiting time variable. So 
that that's how you get the waiting time the final is response time and how do you measure response time now that's a very tricky and challenging thing so response time is amount of time taken uh, from when the request is submitted until the first response is produced uh, not necessarily output okay uh, it's a response like the the user response may be in uh, various different uh, you know you can see it in very different different ways so this is very relevant for a time sharing environment obviously it has to be minimized so what do we really want we want say for example the time between the press of a key and that key being shown on the screen now in most of the times it is very instantaneous it takes hardly few microseconds to get done and we can't even observe with with our eye but particularly when your system is running very slow and you have a lot of workload you will even notice that your response time starts getting affected but to type something and it takes a few seconds to show up on the screen and your response time has gone down so uh, uh, how to measure response time i think that is uh, uh, there is not a very straight forward answer for that because the response time is ultimately what is perceived by the end user so uh, what you really need to do to measure response time often is to instrument your kernel to not down request and uh, note down the time when the request is completed and that involves lot of changes to the kernel code that is what i mean by instrumenting the kernel code so you may have to change your code in many places if you really want to note down the response time for example one program sending a request for scanf and now obviously you can't accommodate for the time taken by the end user to press the key right in the response time you have to start from the moment the user presses the key and the time taken between it show, it being shown on the screen so that would obviously need changes in you know at least in two places in the kernel code and if you are talking of response time for example from network from disk io and lot of other input output systems and from the kernel itself for example i press the close button and the process has to uh, the, the window has to be closed then that will also require changes in code paths for example in exit and so on so measuring response time is not not very uh, straight forward compared to other criteria just to measure the response time you may need changes in lot of places in the kernel all right now one important challenge that remains in implementing scheduling algorithm and we will see the algorithms now is that you really cannot know the number of cpu bursts and number of io bursts and the duration of each before the process runs it's not possible to know it because before you execute it the process is a program lying on the disk and it's not possible to analyze it for the amount of cpu and io bursts it will do although what we do is suppose i run an algorithm then while doing numerical problems to understand the algorithm we assume some values all right we assume when we say a process will have a cpu burst of 6 microseconds then i am just assuming it fine it is it is not possible to calculate it beforehand it is just something which we have assumed for doing the analysis of the algorithms one final concept there is something called as a gantt chart It is basically a time lapse chart, timeline chart showing the sequence in which processes get scheduled. It is used for analyzing a scheduling algorithm. So, for example, here is a Gantt chart. So, what does this chart mean? That process one executed from time zero to time twenty-four. Process two executed from twenty-four to twenty-seven, and P three from twenty-seven to thirty. That is what this chart shows, and this is called a Gantt chart. All right. Now, once again, before we see the algorithms, I want to remind you. that uh, there can be differing requirements in choosing a scheduling criteria so we saw some five criteria uh, you know on which you can measure a scheduling algorithm but uh, before you choose algorithm what really needs to be seen is what is actual requirement of the users who are going to use your operating system so there are different users which actually need a different treatment of the scheduling criteria so that's a working the knowing the workload is a challenge so for example if you are using a desktop system then the response time becomes very important because a desktop system most of the time people will be doing io and they would like to get a good response time so the challenge now becomes that do you want to minimize the average response time or minimize the variance in the response time uh, do you want to have a system which is sometimes fast sometimes slow 
or we want to have a system which is reasonable and gives a predictable response time. So, you know, which exactly out of these you want to achieve will largely impact the scheduling algorithm that is implemented. Fine. So, what we will do is we will now discuss scheduling algorithms, but we will do analysis with only one CPU burst per process. Ideally, what we should do is we should do it for hundreds of CPU bursts, but then we really don't have that much time to do that much analysis. And uh, initially, what we are going to do, we are going to calculate the waiting time for different processes. We are going to evaluate only one criteria, that is the waiting time. So let's begin discussing some scheduling algorithms. I am once again checking if there are any questions in the chat. Okay, no questions. I uh, will wait for a few seconds before we start with the scheduling algorithms. Uh, you can ask your questions. All right, let's proceed. So the first algorithm we study is first come first serve. As the name suggests, it's a very simple algorithm. The process which arrived first, that is the process which was forked first, will get scheduled first. Uh, here is an example. Uh, process P1, P2, P3 under burst time in the listed now. Suppose they were created, that is forked in this order, P1, then P2, then P3. Then the Gantt chart will simply look like this. First you select P, should in P1 for 24 units of time, then P2 for further 3, 24 to 27, P3, 27 to 30. Very simple. What is the waiting time for P1 now? P1 got scheduled immediately, so no waiting time. P2 had to wait 24 new units of time, assuming that it came slightly later. And then P3 will have to wait up to 27 units of time, assuming it came later. So the average waiting time will be you know, 24 plus 27 by 3, that is 17. So, very simple. Now, this is a non-preemptive algorithm. Understand it, please. First come, first serve by definition is non-preemptive. Because if you say uh, that, say, this process P1 can get interrupted. So, let us say this was time 10, and you said it could get interrupted. Now, the question is, what do you do after P1? You have algorithm which is first come, first serve. Now, even after P1 was interrupted, who remains the first to be scheduled? P1 remains the first to be scheduled. So, you got interrupted here, but again after that you keep running P1. So, all you have done is you have wasted this little amount of time in doing the scheduling by scheduling the same process again. So, it makes no sense to have a preemptive first come first serve. It has to be non-preemptive. That means there should be no interrupts. There should be no interrupts when you are doing first come first serve algorithm. The only way that some other process can get scheduled is when one process either terminates or goes to a wait queue for an IO. Now, how do you achieve non-preemption? I think that is easy to answer how to achieve non-preemption. You can easily find out find that out in XP64. Uh, another example, suppose the same process is arrived in some different order, that is P2, P3, P1, then you will have this kind of chart P2, then P3, then P1 and now the waiting time is less actually because uh, P2 had to wait nothing, P3 waited only for 3 seconds while P1 waited for 6. So effectively I have 3 units of average waiting time which is much better. Now first come first serve can actually suffer from what is called as a convoy effect. So let us try to understand what is this convoy effect. Consider that there is one CPU one process and many IO bound processes. Now, the CPU bound process gets scheduled. So, obviously, it will keep running, right? It will keep running. And uh, IO bound processes, let us say, they are in the IO wait queues. Now, what happens is that the IO bound processes finish their IO and they move to the ready queue and they wait for the CPU bound process to finish. Here, it is assumed that the IO interrupts are happening. Only the timer interrupt is not happening. 
but the IO interrupts are actually happening. That is how the IO bound processes can move to the ready queue. If there were no interrupts being handled, then you they obviously cannot move to the ready queue because the interrupt handler has to run. But the, what is being run on the CPU? The CPU bound process. And when this is happening, the IO devices will remain idle. Now, it is possible that the CPU bound process had very small amount of IO burst. So it goes for an IO burst now. Now what happens, the IO bound processes will now run quickly and they will move to the IO queues again because they are a very small period of CPU execution and then there is nothing to schedule on the CPU. Because the CPU bound process is also doing IO, IO bound processes anyway were not doing much IO, so they are uh, not doing much CPU utilization. So they are over quickly and then the CPU is remaining idle. So now whenever the CPU bound process is ready to run, that is its IO is over, it will run. But then for example, it was uh, waiting for an end user input and that takes a lot of time. Then effectively what you have is that the CPU will remain idle for a long period of time. So this will actually lead to a lower CPU utilization. So it would have been better actually in this case if the IO bound processes were running first. That is, you know, they get over and then uh, there is no uh, convoy effect that we have observed here. Further, you know, the first come first serve becomes very troublesome for interactive processes. Why? Because the CPU bound processes may actually hog the CPU and then processes which want to do I.O., they may have to wait for a long time and the response time will go down. So interactive processes may not get a chance to run and response time may be quite bad. So that is another uh, big uh, drawback of the first come first serve algorithm. Okay. The next algorithm that we study is what is called as shortage of first scheduling. Now here what we say that uh, with every process we can associate the length of its next CPU burst and use these lengths to schedule the process with the shortest time. So maybe a better name to this algorithm would be a shortest, not job, the shortest next CPU burst scheduler because the job kind of gives an impression that job is the complete process. While we are not looking at the complete time of the complete process, but only the next CPU burst. And when you say shortage job first. Now shortage job first is actually an optimal algorithm from the perspective of the waiting time. Because it will always select the shortest process and that is why it will minimize the waiting time for other processes because the smallest process is going to run first, so the waiting time is effectively reduced to the minimum. Of course, the problem remains in knowing the next CPU burst time. You can't never, you can you cannot ever know this, right? Because it's like predicting the future. So precisely knowing it is not possible until the process actually executes. Uh, one suggestion they have is that you, can, you could ask the user, but then, <laughs> That's a very bad idea, right? How do you even know how long your process will execute on CPU and how long will it execute the I.O.? Even for end user, it is very difficult to know and tell the amount of, you know, the, the duration of the CPU burst. So here is an example of the shortage of first. So four processes and these are their burst times. So obviously, the shortest will get scheduled first. So first P4, then P1, then P3, then P2. So you have this Gantt chart, P4, then P1, then P3, then P2. Now you can calculate the average waiting time. P1 waited for 3, P2 waited for 9, P P2 waited for 16. So the sum divided by 4, 7, that is the average waiting time. Now we just now discussed that uh, knowing the next CPU burst is practically not possible because you can't know what is the process going to do next. But you can always try to do an approximation. You can always try to do what is called as an approximation. How do you do the approximation? Uh, one simple way of doing that is assuming that the future will be like history. Assuming that the future will be like history. Because you can know the history of a process. You can try to predict the future depending on the history. So as I said, it is not possible to implement SJF. Because you really cannot know the next CPU burst. You can only estimate, all right? And estimation can be based on the previous knowledge. So what you can do is you can pick the process with the shortest predicted, okay, shortest predicted next CPU burst. 
Now, what, how, how can you do this? You can use the concept of what we call as exponential averaging. Now, if you can recollect, we have actually used this concept in computer networks as well, the concept of exponential averaging. So, what you can do, you can, uh, you know, use the length of the previous CPU bus to predict the future. And you can simply employ a formula like this. This is the most typical exponential averaging formula. Tau n plus 1 equal to alpha Tn plus y n minus alpha tau n. So what is Tn? Tn is the actual length of the previous CPU burst. So what you are doing, you are multiplying the previous one immediate previous burst by alpha. And tau n plus 1 is the next predicted value. And obviously this is the earlier predicted value. So this you are multiplying by 1 minus alpha. Where is, where, what is alpha? Alpha is some number between 0 and 1. Commonly alpha is set to half. And uh, with this what you have is a preemptive version actually called the shortest remaining time first. So even if the next CPU burst of a process was uh, say 30 microseconds, you could actually schedule it for 10 microseconds and then have a timer interrupt and then the process will have 20 microseconds left. So you can have a preemptive version also, alright, uh, of this algorithm, which will be called shortest remaining time first. So here is an example of how the how the how the prediction will actually look like. So this line shows the actual CPU burst time: six, then four, then six, then four, then suddenly thirteen and it remains 13 for a long period of time, the process keeps doing 30 seconds time burst. If you have alpha equal to half, oh, this should have been alpha, not A, this should have been alpha, and initial estimate is 10, because some you have to make some initial case, right, even before the process starts running. So initial case was 10, but because the actual time was 6, you will see that the prediction comes down. And then it was 4, the prediction comes further down. And then the prediction will take a curve path like this. Uh, and then the, you will see that if the process keeps executing steadily the same amount of CPU bursts, slowly the predicted time will approach the actual time. So that is how the behavior of the predicted time is with respect to the actual time. It tries to approach the actual time. Right? Examples now. So suppose we have alpha equal to 0. Now look at our formula. We say alpha in to the immediately previous calculation plus y minus alpha into tau n that is the previous prediction. So if you have alpha equal to 0 then essentially your next guess is equal to the previous guess and you are not going to count the recent history. right? If you have alpha equal to 1 then you will have tau n plus 1 is alpha into tn. So you are going to count only the last CPU burst. If you do the expansion of the formula, you will get a formula which use exponents like this. That is 1 minus alpha raised to power n plus 1 into tau 0 plus 1 minus alpha raised to power j into uh, tn minus j and so on. So different earlier actual timings will get a different weightage with the maximum weightage being given to the immediately previous burst. This is lesser weightage, this is even less weightage and so on. So that is how you will get the exponential average of the time. Now, because both alpha and alpha minus 1 are less than or equal to 1, every successive term will have less weight. So, the, as I said, maximum weight is given to Tn, but lesser weight is given to Tn plus 1, even less to Tn, Tn minus 2 and Tn minus 5 and so on. Least weight is given to tau 0, because 1 minus alpha is to power n plus 1 will be a very small number. So, that's how this algorithm works. So I think some of you are trying to implement shortage of first. So first of all, it's not possible to implement shortage of first. You will have to do an estimation, you know, using this. And that will definitely involve a lot of bookkeeping and a lot of calculations. Uh, but if you are willing to do that, uh, you are most welcome to implement a shortest remaining time first algorithm. So here actually, the shortest remaining time first is nothing but a preemptive shortest job first and uh, now we can add the concept of varying arrival times and preemption because the processes actually don't arrive at the same time they keep arriving at different points in time and uh, you can estimate the time that is shortest remaining time and keep scheduling them in a preemptive fashion so for example suppose the processes arrive at different points in time 
and these are their different burst times. So you can now schedule them something like this. Process P1 arrived and that time there was no other process at zero. So it will get scheduled. But immediately at time one, process P2 arrived, it had four seconds of time. P1 has seven seconds left. So now P1 will get preempted and P2 will run. P2 is running and P3 arrives. But see, P2 has run for one second and the time is two. P2 has three seconds left and P3 arrives, which has nine seconds left. So what you'll do, you'll continue running P2. Then at time three, P4 also arrives, but P4 has five seconds left. But now P2 has two seconds left. So you will keep running P2. And P2 will complete. At this time, which is the process with the shortest burst? You will notice that the process with the shortest burst is P4. This still has nine seconds left. So you will schedule P4. After P4, you know, see P1 is still pending seven units of time. Right? Seven is more than, uh, seven is less than nine. So now P1 will get scheduled and then P3 will get scheduled. So this is what we say is a preemptive shortage of first algorithm and the processes will now keep actually getting preempted and also be setting, getting selected depending on their shortest remaining time. So here you can do the average waiting time calculation, maybe some 6.5 milliseconds. All right, so we will stop now and I will continue tomorrow with more scheduling algorithms and uh, we will complete this tomorrow, the discussion on scheduling.